Hi, Deanna. Oh, I think you're on. Uh, we're just gonna get started in a bit. I'll pause for now. Hi, Carla. Hi, Saul. I'm just uh, making sure that everybody's allowed to share. Yeah, I want to make sure everyone's um, able to share their um, screen. I think I set it up as that, but I just want to make sure. Okay, fantastic. So all panelists will be able to um, share their screens now. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Just trying to figure it all out.
shaping this talk. Thank you, Connor. Great. Thanks so much, Saul. Um, good afternoon to everyone who's joining us from Mi'kma'ki and from uh, territories in the central part of uh, what is now called Canada. And good morning from uh, for you West Coasters. I know there's some, several of you joining us, uh, maybe even some of my family members. Um, so before we uh, before we go, I just like to ground myself. Uh, and considering that I'm I'm standing, I'm sitting um, in Mi'kma'ki on the unceded and, and, and ancestral territories of the Mi'kmaq Nation, and um, and just want to uh, think through. Uh, the practices that we have uh, holding these territories in terms of not only obviously Mi'kmaq practices, but also the treaties of, of peace and friendship that were first signed in the 1700s. Um, and thinking through those, those practices of reciprocity, of responsibilities, of shared responsibilities, shared um, and shared respects um, as pathways for all of us to, to move forward together in good ways. And so I'm hoping that Today in our conversations, especially in our Q&A, Ursula brought this forward uh, at the beginning of our, our little chat here about being mindful of, of how we engage with each other and how we do so in productive and, and sometimes challenging ways, but in respectful ways, in ways that um, make it for that we are accountable to ourselves um, and, to, and to each other. So um, just wanted to, to bring that forward. I am so delighted um, to be able to um, introduce um, today's uh, speakers. Uh, we have three incredible artists, thinkers uh, joining us today. And I'd like to thank you, all three of you, for spending and sharing your Saturday afternoon with us. Um, and um, our panel today is thinking through, obviously connected to the, the broader workshop that is engaging with the notion of the possibilities of museums being living monuments, while also acknowledging the difficult and challenging histories um, that are embedded in colonial institutions, such as galleries and museums. Um, we've talked a little bit about uh, this panel kind of considering more broadly um, artistic presence in um, as well as intervention, engagement, critique and response to museum and gallery context, histories and practices um, and thinking through potentially the role of artists in, in bringing forward um, and art making, uh, creating living monuments and living archives as well as the potential for decolonization and social justice within these contexts. Um, so those are just obviously very broad, broad thematics. Uh, that we'll, we'll be kind of considering um, and um, we'll have our presentations and then most likely I would imagine uh, uh, Peter and, and Ursula and Deanna will have some things to say afterwards um, to, together. Um, I'll try not to say too much um, uh, and then we'll have a, a Q&A facilitated by, by Saul and myself uh, making sure there's space for you to share um, your questions. So thank you all for being here today. Um, what I thought I would do is just read the sh very short bios that I have um, for each artist and then and then we'll, we'll open up um, with our first speaker, which is Peter. And so um, Peter Morin um, is a grandson of Taltan ancestor artists. Uh, Morin's work highlights cross ancestral collaboration and deeply considers the impact zones that occur between indigenous ways of knowing and settler colonialism. Um, Peter has, an, I think it's like over 20 year um, incredible uh, career. Um, and has exhibited across um, Canada and the United States, but also internationally, and is a uh, professor at uh, OCAD University. And so I just want to say thank you so much for being here, Peter, and I'll open it up, open it up to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I thought you were going to read everyone's bio. I was like, I think I said oh. I was going to. Sorry, <laughs> I changed my mind. I thought, you know what? Let's just go, and then we'll we'll, we'll break it up. Sorry, my, my fault. I got it's excited. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. I'm like, I'm super into. I'm super into this, and I mean, I I think I should start by just acknowledging my how my body is feeling uh, and how my body has been feeling over these past days and weeks. Uh, you know, I'm having good days and bad days, just like everyone, but I just want to bring that into this space with us because we are human bodies and this is what we are experiencing, you know? Um, and, I, and it's not business as usual, right? It's something else. And we, we come to these spaces, hopefully um, reaching beyond the established structures, right? Uh, reaching towards each other, you know. Um, my name is Peter Morin. Uh, uh, my indigenous name, my Di Denek Eh Anya, is Azekta. 
that's my name. Uh, our grandmother gave me this name when I was 13 years old. Uh, and it was after a lot of uh, a particular struggle by our mother to find me a name. She used to take me to uh, all these elders and uh, they'd kind of look at me in that elder way and be like, you know, two hours later, they'd be like, no, nothing came. <laughs> He's a, he has no purpose yet. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm connecting today from uh, Toronto, which is the treaty territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit and uh, traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, Huron-Wendat. I also want to uh, acknowledge the Métis people and all of the urban folks, urban indigenous folks who have so much roots in these territories. And I come also from, I come to this conversation today from, from Telegraph Creek, where our blood is from. Yeah, where our family is from, where our family tree is from. Uh, and historically, uh, historically, weird word, um, that is the place where the two rivers meet. That is our territory, yeah. And I'm really grateful to be here with folks I just love and adore and to be able to listen. Uh, I think it is really important and I know will help fill my heart up again. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about museums for a long time and you know, I was thinking, how do I, how do I offer to this conversation? Because there's been a lot of really incredible work from many indigenous people. Um, many uh, BIPOC artists about uh, the harm that uh, museums have caused, not just our bodies, but also our knowledge practice and production. Um, that the museum that exists in Canada for the most part exists because of extractive technologies, extractive actions, uh, let the artwork that is made by the people is the resource that creates and makes people uh, stronger. Um, so it really makes sense if you're wanting to like diminish the strength of a people uh, to steal their artwork. Uh, so I was thinking, I've been thinking about that a lot and you know, I've had the privilege of being in love with museums and, and really hating museums. Uh, um, that used to be the like the punchline of my joke, uh, my my uh, presentations, you know, previous. I have a love affair. I have a love affair going on with the museum, and I hate the museum. But I've been uh, able to work in museums quite a bit over the years, you know. So I thought, in thinking about my offering for today, I was like, okay, maybe I just list, maybe I just list the things, you know. But what, you know, what? That's not too fun for me. Um, and I've been also feeling my age lately and my body lately, you know, after 15 to 20 years of being a performance artist and like beating yourself up, you eventually start to feel your body, you know. So I, today I was thinking, you know, there's a few, um, there's a few possible things that happen in museums. Uh, the Royal BC Museum invited me twice uh, to work, to do a performance art uh, work in the museum. Um, but I, I think I want to start with, you know, being in uh, undergraduate school and I know I only have 10 minutes, 10 minutes. So you got to cut me off, Carla, when I... Oh, you can take a few more. You can take a few Okay. More. Okay. Because I, you know, I could, I can also talk for three hours straight. <laughs> and, and I'm holding the eagle feather. <laughs> <laughs> There's something about that piece around how do you how do you want your body to feel powerful? Like, and how do you make your body feel powerful, right? And as an indigenous body, you have all of these messages that tell you you're not you you don't deserve the power that you have. Like that's an actual, you know, it's we maybe we translate that into macro and micro aggressions, you know. So as uh, you know, I was trained as a printmaker, uh, Emily Carr, and I, the only reason why I became a printmaker was because um, it was, first of all, it was the class I could register for. It's the only one I could get into. <laughs> and second of all, um, the museum, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out how to steal from the museums. Right. So, uh, but I knew that this printmaking, uh, I could actually take the image 
that the museum uh, took of our work, our Taltan Nation artwork, and I could print it into multiples, and then I could take it back home. So I did that for a few years, actually. You know, um, there was one piece called uh, "Taltan Women Wear This in Their Hair," and uh, this is when I also like uh, started in this weird uh, relationship with the anthropologist uh, James Tate. He's an old, you know, from 1910. He was in our community, gathering and extracting knowledges and artwork and stories and songs. And uh, so this image was taken by James Tate of a puberty regalia that young, young women uh, wore during their puberty seclusion time, right? And I'm using all these English language words. They are not the right words. They call it puberty seclusion time, but uh, it's actually education. It's school. It's a master's degree in Taltan Nation uh, history and culture, right? That's what was going on for these young, girl, young girls as they transformed themselves into women. Um, and, you know, so this re regalia hadn't been in our community for a hundred years, but I knew that I could recreate it, you know? Um, so I did a lithography, I caught, you know, transferred the image onto the stone, did the lithography and took it back to our community and gave it to elder women who, um, because of all of the interventions and uh, obstructions by the Canadian government into Indigenous communities, they had missed the chance to uh, have that education from their, the community of women uh, written about as puberty seclusion time, right? And so I gave it back to them and I said, this is what this is, what this, is. this is what I've learned. I don't know anything else about this, but I, I just want you to have this. You know, um, my very first museum intervention was the day I became a performance artist. Uh, and it was at, uh, it was in 2005, so 15 years. And uh, I never thought I was gonna be a performance artist at all, but I was interested in this, this challenge that Karen Bembeset, uh gave to me, which was, if you could do anything in the museum, what would you do? She opened that up to me, you know? There exists no documentation of this, only stories of this performance, you know? And um, that carries forward to like these moments at the Royal BC Museum, for example, where we, this, the first performance where I became Andy Kaufman and did stand-up comedy for totem poles. And, you know, so at some point in the creative practice and production, you amp up, the risk factor, like it's a performance artist, right? There is a mediation of risk and an awareness and an acknowledgement of risk. Become, doing stand-up comedy for totem poles, that's actually risky. Um, and, and in the moment of being able to do this, finding out new spaces for the museum, within the museum for possibility, right? So I um, set up a wrestling ring because Andy Kaufman also wrestled, you know? So I thought maybe I'd wrestle with one of the totem poles. Um, and then I, you know, you, I pushed this thing out of the way and then found the elevator that they used to get the totem poles into that level of the um, museum. Because uh, the, the indigenous artwork is on the third floor of that museum, right? Uh, and so in the performance, I was able to, you know, bang my ar you know, arms on these elevator doors and I turned the whole museum into a drum. Yeah. And uh, I sang, uh, at the time I was doing all this, uh, these interventionist kind of things like love songs to colonization. So I sang um, a Taltan song, which then turned into, we don't need another hero by Tina Turner. <laughs> I think there's, an, there's a, a beautiful pursuit here of, of um, the, the possibility of the museum as a location, right? Um, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna forego that. There's a lot of power and energy in that space, which for me and for many indigenous people and specifically indigenous artists that I've been able to talk to, turns it into a site of sacredness. So that piece around being in that space, coming into that space very particularly with uh, an acknowledgement of sacredness 
as a way to protect yourself. So when I was working with kids, for example, I would, you know, we would do a ceremony before we went into the museum. Yeah. Um, so I guess fin just finally, because I, I don't want to take up too much space. I want to hear from my lovely friends on the panel as well. And um, so all of this continues, right? Oh, I, I, you know, my love affair and my hate affair <laughs> with museums um, uh, continues, you know, and I've, I've had uh, wonderful colleagues who I've collaborated with, like Karen Dufik, who worked with me on Peter Morin's museum, uh, which was a bit of a trip, you know, that's a bit of a trip, that exhibition. Um, but now I'm thinking about and working towards um, uh, repatriating silence from the museum. Yeah. And thinking about indigenous, like it, in, indigenous silence is not as absence, not as an absence of indigeneity, but silence is, repositioning it completely as uh, indigenous power and agency. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, like this word repatriation is also a little bit like we have communities work so hard for it, but I mean, really, we should also be considering the intangible things as well. Yeah, and, and, and then when you take that silence uh, and honor it and you take it back to your home territory and release it to the territory, like how does that feel? How does that work? How does that add to our conversations? Um, how does silence actually sound? Because we just still, um, uh, when we're thinking about the intersection of indigeneity or black uh, BIPOC folks and the museum, right? We're still, I feel we're still sort of very much uh, uh, relying on the uh, structures of power to mediate back to us what that power is that is hidden in there, you know? Um, and, and I guess finally, um, the piece about indigenous artists being the most, being very powerful, like, um, you know, we hear these stories about when indigenous folks met the early traders or early colonizers or early settlers, right? There's always this talk about, uh, you know, they traded for beads, you know? Uh, and it's like, well, actually what they did was they traded for artist materials. Those are artist materials. They prioritized artist materials and they pri prioritized artist practice and production, right? And so when you think about museums and the artist unknown, and you think about museums and 3% of their entire collection uh, is on display and the rest of it is hidden, like it's a very purposeful um, action um, because indigenous artists are so powerful, you know, they don't, and we have fought to remain powerful. Yeah. Um, thank you. <laughs> Pat. Pass it over. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. <laughs> that was, and I can't wait to pick up on some of those threads um, together um, after our next two presenters. Um, and and um, I, I keep having moments where I can see some of the work in my mind. So I'd love to um, further co uh, the conversation around, especially silence. That's that's a beautiful concept. So thank you, thank you so much for sharing. Um, our next presenter, as I, I said, I was not going to do this, but our next presenter is um, is uh, Deanna Bowen. Sorry, I'll apologize a little bit. Um, I have uh, two um, beautiful children upstairs who are, are screaming, so I got a little distracted <laughs> at first. If it, if it makes you feel any better, y'all saw the cat going back and forth, <laughs> did you not? Yeah. 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 And so I'm trying, to, I'm trying to be as poised as I can be, and I think I, I'm doing okay, but... Um, yeah, just to be also, you know, just the, the reality of, of how we're, we're doing these things. Uh, I've basically placed my family upstairs with, uh, you know, some movies and snacks. So um, with my partner. So I thank him for, for helping me facilitate this as well. Um, so our next speaker is, is Deanna Bowen. Thank you so much for being with us uh, today. Um, and Deanna Bowen 
is a descendant of two Alabama and Kentucky born uh, black prairie pioneer families from Amber Valley and Campsy, Alberta. Bowen's family history has been the central pivot of her autoethnographic interdisciplinary work since the early 1990s. She is the recipient of the 2020 Governor General Award for Visual and Media Arts Award, which is fantastic. Congratulations, that's amazing. Um, and also an assistant professor of studio arts at Concordia University. So thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to have you and I'll, I'll, I'll mute myself now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for uh, welcoming me. Um, I am uh, want to extend greetings from Jojake, uh, Montreal, um, my brand new home as of uh, July. Um, and because I can talk longer than you, Peter, I'm going to just go right into this <laughs> uh, and I'll share my screen, okay? All right, can you see my presentation? I hope so. Yes. Uh, and where I wanna start, uh, there we go. Um, so thank you for having me here. I, I uh, do tend to wander, so I'm going to be tr very, very quick just to set up my practice. So um, as Carla had mentioned, my work is about my family, and this particular stream of work is about this side of the family, my grandmother's side of the family. Um, and these are my great grandparents, Jeannie and Willis Bowen. Um, they, uh, when they came to Canada, they were met with incredible pushback. Uh, they migrated from, uh, plantations in Alabama and Kentucky, and then migrated through Kansas and then ultimately Alabama, or sorry, uh, Oklahoma, uh, then Indian Territory. Uh, and they had homesteads along the way, all the way. And of course, when uh, Indian Territory was made into a state, uh, white terrorism, uh, it was at its peak and my family came across in 1911. Uh, why I mentioned that is because of it, it, uh, it is the central kind of pivot of the of this presentation. And of course, a number of bodies of work since probably 2013. And one of the biggest things that that involves is uh, a petition that was created that was in response to my great grandparents' uh, migration and the community's migration. Effectively, it is a, a lynch mob petition urging Prime Minister Laurier to ban this migration of Black Indigenous people. Uh, otherwise, they'd be obliged to resort to killing them. So. The family doesn't talk about it, the community doesn't talk about it, but my work is about excavation of history and, and it really is caught up in silence primarily. Uh, so what I did is I was able to source the petition uh, and the library archives and then I turned that into a, a, a work. And so Lisa Myers, uh, not to belabor this because I can go on, uh, Lisa Myers installed it in her exhibition Carry Forward at the Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery. And uh, that was 2017, 2017, it's now touring still, I think. Um, and in that exhibition, in the installation of this petition, there was a discovery of a signature by a gentleman named Barker Fairley. Um, and that discovery uh, informed the production of this show, The God of Gods, a Canadian play, which was at Hart House at U of T. And it was a project that was commissioned to commemorate Hart House theaters, uh, the Hart House building's 100th anniversary. Um, so Barker Fairley is the cat with the, with the pipe in the middle of this photograph. And you might well recognize the rest of these people. These are all a group of seven painters. And so the question and all of my work kind of comes from this place of asking the question, well, what does it mean of this guy, the guy that's responsible for the construction of the narrative of, of, of national importance about group of seven paintings? What does it mean if this guy is the, uh, who is willing to sign a petition to kill black indigenous people uh, is held up as a central figure in Canadian national culture? And what does it mean about the group of sevens uh, bodiless landscapes? Another way to think about it is that that petition is a roadmap. It is a document that speaks to a community of white uh, racist people, uh, elite white racist people who uh, all agree on a similar kind of mindset of killing black indigenous people. And of course, just by nature of the geographics of the petition itself, Alberta, Edmonton, Calgary, that kind of stuff, you can get a sense that it is effectively a map of sorts to tell you where white supremacy lives. Um, so, I, so I'm keeping that in mind. I follow Barker fairly. He happens to uh, teach at U of T. 
uh, he uh, was at University of Alberta when he signed the petition. He transferred to U of T, German scholar, and he went on to teach there until he retired in the 60s and he became a painter after that. And his work is often exhi exhibited within the shadow of the group of seven itself. So in following Barker Faraday to U of T, what I ultimately came to find and what I started working on is uh, using, and I've always done this, but primarily using documents that are related to the history of Hart House Theater, um, white documents produced about the history of, of Hart House Theater to kind of give the white audience, predominantly university-based white audience, uh, uh, look at themselves and look at its history, the institution, the university's lineage. And so Barker Fairley ends up on the art committee at Hart House uh, and Hart House Theater. And uh, in their time frame, they produced a uh, play by a gentleman named uh, Carol Akins, and the name of the play was The God of Gods. Uh, and the play is a hot mess of, of horrible racist tropes. And so my job in this exhibition was to excavate as much material from the archive that would illustrate what kind of a community of white men he was part of, and what kind of preoccupations they had in the time of their uh, cultural careers. In his immediate circle of players, Vincent Massey, uh, uh, author, uh, spearheader of the Massey Report and then the Massey, uh, the Canada Council and all of those things, National Archives, National Gallery, Ontario Art Gallery, all of those things. He's part of this group as is Duncan Campbell Scott, uh, a number of other, all of the G7 painters and a number of other high society, society players. In this time frame, they all imagined themselves to be artists. And so I'm looking at their cultural production at the time, which all largely revolves around performance of indigeneity, um, deeply problematic uh, uh, portrayals of indigenous peoples. But I'm also looking at here in this exhibition is how to uh, look at this exhibition and the things that they produce in this time frame as another kind of um, a kind of a study of a system of dissemination. I'm thinking about my own work primarily about excavating uh, my family's history and then contextualizing it within greater kind of archival networks, mostly white networks, and then flipping it over on itself by presenting it in a gallery space. And here uh, in this instance, I'm bringing all of this dirty laundry effectively to the surface, knowing that this 100th anniversary will ensure that U of T will document the shit out of it. And then that will go back into their archives, right? And in fact, I did not know that the uh, Hart House has a, or the Art Museum has a, a parchment binder, like the, it's, a, it's a founding documents uh, collection that they have on parchment. The first exhibitions, uh, the artists of the first exhibition signed that, uh, that parchment booklet. And when my commission opened, I was asked to sign this for the 100th anniversary. So my name goes into the annals of however you say that, um, of the University of, uh, of Toronto's archive. My name, this intervention is documented in their archives. They paid for this interve intervention in their archives. And those are a lot of the things that I'm thinking about. This project aside, any of my work relies on an understanding that one, art making is a means of, uh, of historical writing. Uh, two, I'm making use of every single art system that comes out of the out of the museum itself. I'm making use of their mailing uh, email addresses. I'm making use of their dissemination of brochures. Everything is is being used for the purpose of displaying white terror, white racism, and the contact the confines, the context around my family's migration. One, and then I rely on gallery the gallery's own desire to document itself as white people, as white institutions do. Uh, I, I'm ensuring that my intervention goes back into their archives, and there is at least something that interrupts that rhythm, right? What we ended up doing, and this is where my fine friend Peter comes into the equation, is uh, what I did to take up the conversation about that play was this, this horrible play that ultimately we all decided would be harmful to reproduce, uh, is we had a, a roundtable conversation about what that document means, what it says about white people, and then what it says about Canadians, white nationalist culture, and how it really has never changed, right? Everything is everything. Uh, everything is as it was. 
Uh, and then in doing that, it kind of opens up a bigger discussion about things like reparations or what would uh, justice look like. Uh, and also the affinities between uh, blackface, redface, whiteface, and what these all, all of these constructions speak to about white people and their uh, state of being spiritually bereft. So all that to say, that conversation culminates with a very fine quote by my friend Peter, who begs the question the why we have all been trained or taught to think that the group of seven paintings are beautiful when in fact what they are are ethnically cleansed landscapes. And it's an important question to ask. Uh, and so what I've done with this project is uh, I extended it because I was in the Berlin Biennale and I, it was this last summer. And so I took that video and I made it the pivot of another body of works that looked at Canada's connection to Germany uh, and uh, the greater kind of uh, discussion around Queen Victoria and her nine royal children who married into other sovereign imperialist nations uh, and the extended kind of uh, imperial project that they maintain. Canada being a central figure in this international network of British colonies, and it's important for me to kind of flag that because we always play this game about little Canada in a global discussion, and Canada is massive, and it is part of uh, the British Empire. So people forget that Queen Victoria actually is culturally German. Her husband was from uh, Germany, and in fact, the family is, even though it's about Britain, it's German. And so it, that was the pivot to give me an opportunity to think about the history of Berlin and its history of performing indigenous culture. Uh, and so I used what we talked about in the first project and bring it over to Canada and I make real deal, li real life connections between the group of seven painters and their colleagues in Toronto and in, in uh, predominantly Ontario to, Ontario to global figures in Germany, all espousing and caught up in the same things, all part of imperialist uh, ambitions uh, for either the German or the uh, British government. So the project starts, this project in particular starts with obviously a family portrait of Queen Victoria and her extended family, uh, of course, both German and Anglo. And then on the other side is a, a reproduction of the uh, petition that was drafted by the six, some uh, people in the Six Nations Reserve that were uh, protesting the Indian Act of 1876. These are interconnected, obviously. Um, and so one, on the one hand, I really just wanna hammer home that the thing that we're fighting right now, this kind of push to quote, quote unquote, decol decolonize, um, inherently I think is not possible, but also what we're working through are the legacies. This is a family drama that we're, this is the legacy of a family spat, literally. Um, all of what we're working through are, you know, descendants of Queen Victoria who marry into other nations and to their royalty and they have imperial battles about who can colonize what best and first. That's what we're working through. And Canada is an outpost of the British imperial uh, ambitions and what we are working through is still very much part of that family spat, largely between Britain and Germany. So, how do I make this connect to the last project I wanna show you? Well, there actually are real deal connections between Berlin, um, Germany, and the next place that I, that I have an exhibition at, which is in uh, Berlin, Ontario. We know it as Kitchener. Uh, and so the project does this job of mapping the interconnectedness between British royalty when it uh, comes to Berlin Kitchener and what they're doing globally and back and forth, da, 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 you get the gist. But Berlin culturally is a predominantly German town, right? It's like, you know, German Mennonite settlers, all that kind of stuff. But if you dig deeper than that, it's also a site that is uh, rife with legacies of uh, the Germans, uh, genocide of the Namibia, Namibia people, um, uh, and then also uh, Britain's uh, plunder in the Boer Wars. And all of that ultimately doing the work of un un um, pushing Black Indigenous bodies off of those landscapes uh, in scorch, uh, scorch policy kind of strategies of literally stripping the land, which is something, of course, we understand here. But it's also a time frame of eugenics and all these other kinds of messed up things. And that brings me to this project. And I'm going to try and get through this really quickly. I'm sorry, Ursula. Um, 
it's a project that delves on the history uh, of this of the town. It draws on again the extensions of Queen Victoria's hand and the monarchy, uh, the monarchies, the imperial monarchies from Germany. Uh, and it does this job of kind of dredging up uh, this darker history that's uh, buried under the uh, underneath the overstory the uh, of of uh, German settlement. The petition comes back to the site of, of the discovery. Um, it's part uh, of this uh, exhibition as well. Serves as a, a kind of a chapter to speak to white terrorism in and of itself. But the exhibition also speaks to the land and the, its relationship to uh, all of these uh, group of seven paintings, these wonderful strip, lands stripped of people that are painted out of this region. And that in many ways, this is kind of the seat of where the group of seven comes from. Homer Watson's paintings, a number of other paintings from other G7 painters, all kind of part of this collection of images that we pull from the Kitchener Waterloo archive. And Crystal Mallory is a big part of this. I want to shout out Crystal Mallory and the pleasure, privilege of working for, with a black curator for the first time in my life and what that does to the creation of an, of an exhibition. And her emotional investment in this project is as deep as mine. She's obliged to learn the history as much as I am and she carries the burden of the pain that this exhibition brings forth. And I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm indebted to her for her willingness to fight the fight to, to make this exhibition happen in this institution itself. So this particular gallery is all images, all uh, barren landscapes by G7 painters. And it sits in conversation with the, um, an oral history by a former slave named Sophia Pooley, who was the former slave of Joseph Brandt. And she speaks to, she tells her story of how she was stolen from her um, first owner and then sold to Brandt. And Brandt brought her and a number of other slaves to the Brantford area. They built his home. She was brutalized by his uh, third wife and he ultimately sold her off to a white family in the region. But it matters so much as to speak to these other people that are on this land that are erased from these landscapes. Uh, and where that leads me to is a bigger discussion about what is the Kitchener-Waterloo region. It's all very much uh, a, a landscape that is marked by the agreement of the Haldeman Tract. Uh, and of course, that leads into discussions around Brantford and all of that region. Uh, it also speaks to the Johnson family and, of course, other kind of issues around Indigenous involvement with British warfare and how Black bodies are entangled in this as well. And it's also a landscape that is uh, central to the Underground Railroad, this land that we also kind of forget about. So what I'm talking about is including these bodies, these Black bodies, these Black stories back into the institution. This is all history that speaks to this particular landscape. And you would never know that central uh, anti-slavery uh, activism came out of this region. John Brown's attack on Harper's Ferry comes out of Chatham, Ontario. Uh, Uncle Tom's cabin is in Dresden, Ontario. And the fact that we don't know these things, the fact that these things have been erased over time, that the first black newspaper comes out of here, like all of that shit, that's what I'm interested in putting back into the institution. This landscape is also a land where many black and indigenous soldiers uh, came from, died for uh, the British in the First World War. Uh, and this is where a personal part of my story comes into it, which is just kind of tracing my second cousin, my cousin, my second cousin twice removed. I'm sorry, y'all. Uh, but, but he was part of a, an all black battalion that was not wanted in that first world war, but that, but he participated nonetheless as were indigenous soldiers. And then thinking about the G7 painters who had the privilege to have uh, sit out the war, have a mental breakdown, Lauren Harris in particular, uh, and then sit it out painting backdrops in the basement of Hart House Theater. You get the gist. So the project is about excavating that history and calling to light the extreme privilege of these white men and their connections to royalty and whatnot, and the ways in which the common person kind of occupied this land in a way that perhaps didn't please the queen and her preoccupations with Canadian nationalist painting, but nonetheless, these people were here. And this job puts them, this project puts them back into the landscape. 
uh, let's see what my last image is. It's also uh, very much a region caught up in eugenics and this matters a great deal. When we talk about the erasure of black and indigenous bodies in this region, there were something like 30 all black settlements in this neck of the woods uh, in the 1900s. And there are probably three that are known the population was 60,000 in 1900, drops to 18,000. And the only thing I can come up with is this, which would be the region of eugenics and pushing black bodies off of the land through their illiteracy. So in many ways, the project is a calling for and a, and a uh, honoring of the dead. And so the project ends uh, with a rendition of mil the military tune taps to, of course, uh, honor the dead over and over and over again. It's a minute and a half song, but it plays for the duration of the exhibition, and it is the over, overarching tone for the exhibition. This is a dark region, and this gallery and Crystal Maori's interventions has made it possible for me to bring their stories forward these black drones, these useless black bodies, and bring them back into the history of this town and this region. And I'll stop there. Yeah. Incredible. Thank you so much, Deanna. Long winded, but there you go. No, no, that was amazing. <laughs> um, and I'm sure we'll be coming back to speak and asking you questions specifically about the work, but incredible how there's there's so many links all the way through your practices, um, just unbelievable. So I'm so glad that you've been able to join us today. Um, and we need to get you to come out to Halifax uh, soon. Feeling it, feeling Let's it. Figure this out, okay. Feeling it. Um, so thank you so much. Um, moving to our, our third and last uh, presenter uh, today, Ursula Johnson. Thank you so much for being with us uh, this afternoon. Um, again, I'll just a brief introduction and, uh, and then I'll, I'll um, mute myself and, and give the stage the floor over to, uh, over to Ursula. Um, Ursula is an artist of Mi'kmaq ancestry. She has participated in over 30 group shows and five solo exhibitions and was recently a part of Abenaqua Day at the National Gallery of Canada. Her performances are often place-based and at times employ cooperative didactic intervention. She was also the recipient of the 2017 prestigious Sobe Art Award. So thank you so much, Ursula, for being with us today. Um, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Carla. Um, I'm assuming everyone can hear me okay. Good. I think I, so my office is in like the community hub where I live in the South Shore here. And I think there's like the Christmas party, but people are dropping in, picking up kids and, you know, all that stuff, but wearing masks, socially distanced, Santa has arrived in um, that room right behind me, so I can barely hear anything. <laughs> um, so let's see if I can get the screen sharing on the go here. Da -da -da. This one and that, does that work? Did it pop up? Has it popped up yet? Okay. Uh, I guess I should have checked it before. Oh, take your time. Just one second. I'll move this over here. What about if I do that here? Screen Maybe that share. Will... Is that working? What do you see? Yes, that's working. We can see. Um... Like a folder yeah, your that's listing things? Yeah. Exactly. Okay, great. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so what I have is, I just have like a few images that I kind of put together, but I'm just, just kind of like writing on what Peter and Deanna have said. You know, I, my own practice, I, I've been kind of looking the past few years, kind of looking at where the, the trajectory of my work and where I'm going um, so that I kind of know like, where do I pick up from now? And, and uh, how do I continue this? I'm just gonna move this over here. There you are. My nice little pink dream catcher there and representing the Anna Leon Owens NASCAT shirt here. Um, so I've been kind of thinking about the, the trajectory of my work and I had an opportunity to do a residency at Queen's University uh, just this past winter um, for the Kerner program there. And 
it, it was really a time to just kind of sit down and look at the timeline of my work and kind of like nerd out on like my own work, which I've never done in my life before. And I was like, let's see. I'm like, what, what have I been talking about for like 15 plus years? And what are the points I was trying to make? And were those successful in what I was doing? Or is there something I need to pick up on and kind of revisit that conversation that I had started, but never really resolved it? It's kind of like an overarching theme of what I'm trying to do in my life generally, is to try to not leave things um, unresolved or kind of like stirred up and then left and walk away. So it's kind of a thing I've been looking at and, and uh, you know, I also acknowledge that it's ha it comes with a lot of privilege to do this type of navel gazing with my art. So I'm very, um, very grateful to have that opportunity to kind of spend that time and look at what I've been doing. And there's always been this theme all throughout and it's all has to do with traveling because I, I travel quite a bit. Um, looking at my body and other person's bodies or that space in between there our bodies and this notion of history and whether or not the history is directly related to my body or to somebody else's body because they've given me the honor and privilege to work with their body in creating performances. Um, so I'm going to share, let's see if this works here. Do, do, do. Quick look. And that, is that working? Can you see? Yeah, okay. So that's just the, that's not where it was. This is where I want to start. Here we go. <laughs> um, don't play. Okay, there. Uh, I'm just going to skip forward. I have to travel back in time. So I have to click the back arrow, right? So I'm not going to go very far back in time. I'm only looking at 2016 because 2016, something happened, um, not just personally in my life, but I, I kind of feel like generally overall um, within the framework of Indigenous art and museums and institutions. There was a lot of things that were happening that kind of shifted a whole direction um, with, within the way that art was being created and how it was being viewed and interacted with. Um, so I, I look at this piece here, which is called Hyde, and I was invited to come to um, Texas, to Houston actually. That was, uh, it was a group exhibition with performance artists from North America that were from culturally diverse backgrounds and worked with body and sight. And so, um, I looked and immediately I thought, well, how does my body relate to Houston? And I couldn't figure out a way how my Mi'kmaq body could relate to a place uh, like Houston. And I was doing a bunch of research and looking things up and find in that process, actually discovering a little bit more about uh, the culture and the ancestry, which my, uh, my grandfather who had passed away recently, um, he's actually where the family name Johnson came from. And it's interesting, Deanna, you bring that up because my grandfather's great grandfather was actually a man who had come to Canada um, through the Underground Railroad and had sought refuge within a Mi'kmaq community. And they asked him what his name was. And he said, I don't have a name, um, but I was owned by Johnson. And then they said, okay, well then we'll call you Robert Johnson. And so that became his name and he married a Mi'kmaq woman. So in looking at kind of the trajectory of my body through time traveling through that land, I thought, well, there's really, there's no connect specifically to Texas, but there's a connection to the South. And then I thought, well, what about if I look at the idea of like the disembodied connection and looking at um, disembodied connection with regards to materiality? Because my family have been makers for a very long time and they've made a number of things, including doing a lot of leather work. But the leather work, oh, sorry, the leather work um, was never, my family, uh, my, well, specifically my community, but even more specifically my family, never learned how to like tan leather and to how to you know make hides or anything like that. So everything always came from a magazine. And the magazine was from Fort Worth, Texas, from Tandy Leather, just big industrial kind of, you know, uh, manufacturing facility. 
And so I thought, well, what if I look at the idea of tanning leather with, uh, you know, working this leather with my body, but also looking at the context of um, the display of knowledge it, as it ties into the history of losing that knowledge of the disembodied kind of culture, the disembodied person of not knowing where your lineage comes from, the materials you work with and all this stuff. So I created this piece um, called Hide. And I actually worked this hide in the space, but it's actually a piece of fun fur that I had cut and stretched out. So nobody ever really knew. They came into the space and they're like, oh my God, what are you making? This is so beautiful. And it doesn't even smell, you know, I thought that it would have a very pungent smell. And, and I'm there and I'm like, oh yeah, there's no smell at all. Isn't that great? You want to touch it? And then they're like, wow, it's so soft. So the people that stayed, you know, and engaged in that conversation, we had really serious conversations and were able to talk about things. But from the first um, kind of first sight or the people that passed by, like this one who was kind of peeking in the window there, um, you know, it was kind of like this, oh, I don't know if I'm allowed into the sacred space. You know, there's a there's a ceremony that's taking place in there. And that and that's kind of the the space that I often come from when I'm looking at museums with regards to performances. I personally find it very difficult to do a performance in a museum because of my indigenous body, because I know that there's uh, such a, a weight um, as if I didn't have a colored body and I was in that space, that I'm just an artist doing what artists do. But the moment that my colored body is in that space, I am demonstrating, I am representing, I am exhibiting, I am educating. There's so much stuff that goes into it. So because of that, I often don't work specifically in those museum spaces to do a performance. Um, so then it kind of moved me a little bit into a different space of like, well, how can I work with people and our bodies together? And this is a performance I did with um, this really amazing Mi'kmaq women's group called Eastern Owl. They're based in Newfoundland. And that's actually St. John's Harbor that you can see in the background there. And so when um, the curator at the rooms there invited me to an exhibition and wanted to do a performance, I said, the only way I can do a performance is if I work with these women and we create something. And it's a part of a series that I've been working on called Land Sings where we actually look at the land, our relationship to the land, and then we create a song together and it's a, a, a commemoration for the land and our bodies. And so we worked on it, but a part of it was also that there's an installation. So we created the installation that actually had the song line that was based on a map of Newfoundland. So I asked my collaborators, where do you want to start? And they had said that they want to start in Boyd's Cove, which is where there's actually a museum for uh, Biafuk culture. And there's actually uh, bodies of Biafuk people that are in those museums. And they said, we want to start there to kind of remember and honor those bodies and that culture. And to think about, you know, traveling that distance from Boyd's Cove all the way to St. John's. So these are actually maps that are based on the same scale that is used in industrial development for resources. Um, and so they, we drew a line from Boyd's Cove all the way down to St. John's, which you can see on the floor there of the image. Um, and then that the song, which was sung in that space, and this is the song line that represented the actual um, geographic point of that line from point A to point B. And then they took this line and then my collaborators and I worked together and then we created a song to match that line. And then we sang it for, uh, I think it was just over three hours in that particular space, which was really lovely. And so it was funny, this little thing, you know, where the curator's like, well, what color is the vinyl gonna be on the, on the wall? for the song line because it's cut out of vinyl. And I said, well, what color is the harbor in February? Because we'll be singing it in February. So I wanna match the color of the harbor because we'll be looking out to the windows. So we had to do this kind of, you know, kind of digging through our, our memories of what color that water would be at that time of year because it changes that body, changes color all throughout the year. Um, and so it was really, it was kind of like that nice little thing that people don't often think about. Um, you know, or 
you just walk in, you're like, oh, wow, it's a vinyl thing. And I'm like, it was really important for us to get that color, <laughs> you know, that, that color of that vinyl just right with that water. Um, and so in, in looking at uh, the, that kind of trajectory of where we we're moving, it was in the winter time of 2017, um, you know, moving out of coming from Houston and then looking at this next season that was arriving after winter when we were moving into summer. And at the same time, I was working on the, the Landmarks project, which was this giant kind of commemorating Canada 150 across Canada. And a number of artists from different regions were all creating response works. And I was really interested in looking at the idea of public art and what public art meant specifically, because I knew that there was, you know, this, this big budget that you can create any type of public art that you want. And I was like, but it's kind of complicated here in the East Coast because Canada 150 does not exist for us. Like we're, our history of colonialism is so old that Canada 150 is just like a drop in the bucket. And so I wanted to look at what does it mean as a Mi'kmaq person who is on this landscape, specifically in Nova Scotia, and even more specifically Cape Breton Island, and how our bodies, along with other people's bodies, have interacted for well over 150 years. And so naturally, it took me to um, kind of looking at the history that passes through time and how that information is taught to the children, because they're the ones that are going to be carrying that story and that information of those histories. And so what I did is I actually went to a local elementary school in the Cape Breton Highlands because the national parks were one of the collaborators with the, the PIA to create this project. And so in working with this elementary school, I had a bunch of kids and I thought, how are we gonna talk about colonialism, about commemoration, about land, about resource, about the sharing of resources or the keeping of resources and about the responsibility within the concepts of stewardship, of information, of history, of land, of food. And so I thought, well, we're just gonna have a conversation because I'm just gonna to talk to them as if they're a room full of 22 year olds and we're doing a university lecture. And I sat there with these little kids and I was like, does anybody know what colonialism is? And someone's like, I do. And I'm like, what is it? And they're like, well, it means when somebody colonizes, Canada is a colony of Britain. I'm like, perfect. Okay, <laughs> moving on. And these kids were amazing. They knew everything. You didn't have to water things down. And it brought us to really intense conversations that were specifically happening in 2017 in the Cape Breton Highlands National Park, which was about the moose call. It was very complicated, it was very heated. There was moose that was being called by the National Park. And because Nova Scotia is in Mi'kmaq territory and the Mi'kmaq government has a direct relationship with the provincial and federal government where in our treaties, it is said in Nova Scotia specifically, and this also is in all of Mi'kmaq, but Nova Scotia has, has it written in our, uh, you know, our political governmental agreement is that the Mi'kmaq people have the first right to resource. So if there's a call of a resource, then the Mi'kmaq people have that first right. And so that meant that the Mi'kmaq people would go into the park and they would harvest this moose. And initially they wanted to work with the local communities because they're from there. We didn't live in the highlands, the Gaelic, the Akkadian, um, the Anglo communities all lived in the highlands. We didn't live there. We lived down by the lakes in the lowlands. And so they, there's community relationships. And so the Mi'kmaq people went to the local guides and they said, well, you can help me and then we'll share this resource together. But then the government says, no, no, no. If you have the first right to resource, you have to do this by yourself, which excluded the other communities, created a division that became very deep and very fraught and very complicated and ended up almost like an entire eight months of fighting between these communities. Old um, traumas were dredged up and all kinds of different things. And then I thought, okay, what is going to happen when I walk into the school with all of these non-Indigenous kids and when I identify as Mi'kmaq, first they're going to be like, 
well, I don't want to talk to you. My uncle says that I'm supposed to hate you, you know, that type of thing. So we had to work through those tensions. So I worked with these kids for an entire six month period where I went back every, every month I would go back and they'd be like, oh, you're back again. And I'm like, yeah, you know, it was a little bit tense last time. I figured I'd come back again. This time I have pizza. And then they're like, oh, okay. And then I come back again a month later and I'm like, oh yeah, I brought some more stuff. This time I brought like a photographer. Is that okay with me? And, and so we're like kind of working through this entire process, having these conversations. And then by the fifth visit, these kids had said, you know, the thing that's really complicated for us is that we are not allowed to harvest this moose that our grandparents and our grandparents as grandparents and our grandparents as grandparents before them have been harvesting because we've been on this land for 465 years. They're like, we know that this is Mi'kmaq land and you've been here, but so have we, we've struggled, we've been here. And so we came to a place of acknowledging that together, we were to share that responsibility of resources and what that meant. So we took the Canada 150 money, pulled it all in into a giant one day festival to celebrate the food, the land, the culture, the stories, the music of the Acadian, the Gaelic, the Mi'kmaq and the Anglo communities. And the festival was designed by these kids that I worked with in the school. They made the menu. They said, this is what my Grammy makes. You know, we have to have these cod cakes. They made uh, the, the designed outfits that would be made. I made the design, the pattern, but they said, well, there has to be a worker uniform because there's workers that are in the parks. And I was like, okay, we'll do. And someone's like, it has to be an apron because there has to be a cook and the cook has to wear an apron. So they created this whole idea. They chose the musicians because they knew everybody in that community. So people's aunts and uncles were hired for musicians, for storytellers, for caterers. The resources for Canada 150 all went back into the community because in the winter time, there's no funds there for any types of jobs. People solely rely on um, tourism. So it was like a big shift, but it was also looking at this idea of a public art piece that was by the public for the public. And at the end of the day, when the festival is finished, and everything's cleaned up, there's nothing left except for the land and the stories on that land. So that when those children go back to that space, they can share those stories with their children and the children after to say, remember that time when there was Canada 150 happening, but this is what we did in our community instead. Um, so it was really important to me to look at that kind of uh, that new way of viewing what public art could be in my practice. And then Fast forward into the fall um, where I was invited to take part in a performance festival that's called Viva that takes place in Montreal, excuse me. And so I had come to this place and thought again, what does my body have to do with this space of Montreal? As a Mi'kmaq woman in Montreal, um, is a bit complicated because Mi'kmaq and Iroquois people, uh, you know, they weren't the best of friends historically, let's say. <laughs> and so I thought, well, if I come bearing gifts into a territory like Jojage, then maybe it'll be a little bit easier for me. But I also wanted to look at all of the things that were happening kind of on a bigger scope with Canada 150, Montreal 375, the missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, so there was these really heavy loaded topics that I wanted to visit through my body, through my body visiting this space. So I thought I would come with a basket because my family are basket makers and they travel selling baskets. In fact, my great grandmother and her sister used to take the train to Montreal and then sell baskets all the way back home and then they would return with their money. So then I took this basket that I had found in um, an antique shop and then I mended it with new ash, um, kind of looking at that idea of having the visible, you know, broken parts of it in Japanese pottery. And so I, I had this basket and then I offered the basket to the Viva Festival. I said, I'm donating this basket to you 
but I want to sell tickets on it for you to fundraise because I know it's basically an artist run festival. You don't have a lot of funding. So let's try to sell tickets as much as we can on the entire four day festival. And at the end of it, we'll do the draw. And then, you know, we'll put the money back into Viva and help you with expenses. So here I am doing the introduction for the basket and there's the basket as it's staged to get ready for my performance. And in it, I had two dozen eggs. And then I also had a railroad tie and um, I had some white pigment and red pigment and two bowls where I would be separating the yolk from the white in order to make a pigment that I used. And I mixed with the railroad tie. And the whole time that this is taking place, um, there's in the space, there is, uh, I don't know if anybody's familiar with it, but it's this giant industrial warehouse in West Montreal where it actually used to be a metal foundry. So when I walked into there to do the site visit initially, I looked up and I saw the huge crane that the crucible used to be hung on. And I looked and I thought, hey, is that usable? And they're like, oh yeah, sure, what, what do you need? Well, I'm just wondering about like suspending something off of it. They said, yeah, no problem. Just let us know and we'll figure it out. And then there's also um, a kitchen in there because Viva actually has a space where there's a, a basically a free meal. So it's by donation, but there's artists that work with food and they curate an entire meal before the night of performances. And so in looking at the artists that were working there, I thought, well, I really want to coordinate what I'm doing with what you're doing. And so I sat down and I met with the artists and I thought, what can we do together? And, and they said, well, what is your performance about? I said, well, it's really kind of heavy and intense about missing and murdered indigenous women, about my body, my Mi'kmaq body being in Iroquois territory, looking at ideas of captivity, enslavement, traveling, moving. And they said, oh, we have the perfect meal. It's actually our institutional dinner. <laughs> and I said, what's the institutional dinner? They said, we're gonna have a little trolley that we're gonna push along. And it has beans and wieners, and then it has like a plum and compote and a beet salad. They said, we're gonna slap it onto those divided plates, throw it in front of you. And then they're walking along and they're like, beans, do you want? No, they said, uh, meat or vegetable? <laughs> because they're from the former Sarajevo, um, Sonia and Andrea. And, and uh, so you're like, well, I think I want meat. And then they slap it on your plate and then they drop it, eat. And then the next one, meat or vegetable, eat. Meat or vegetable, they're just like, drop it in front of you. And then they're barking at you to eat your food because there was only 20 place settings, but like 200 people. So you had to eat very quickly and then move in line. And I thought, okay, I'm going to take that energy that you're creating in that space and amplify it a little bit more. And this notion of moving through line to try to get to the next thing that you need to do. And so I had planted a couple of volunteers in the audience. And I said, this is what it's going to look like. There's going to be two trays, a busing tray for food scraps, one for empty plates, and then a bin with white hazmat suits. So I want people to get up, scrape, put their plate away, put on their hazmat suit, and then go and take their place. And so that happened for a very quick amount of time, very rushed to create this anxiety. And then people were in this space all around me when I entered out in the nude and began to mix these materials where I coated my entire body in the red and then I chalked up my hands and then behind me out of frame here there's actually Olympic rings hanging off the crucible. So I grabbed onto the Olympic rings, lifted my body and then I began my dance that I had composed because I had created um, a score of music to accompany a projection. And in this space where all of these people were around me their white hazmat suits were actually um, my projection screen. So I projected onto them and it was two different projections of, it was as if you were sitting on a train because you can look out the windows as if you're looking and the train uh, is passing by. And, and then at the end of this performance, when I left, I had all of these um, broken blood vessels that were under my arm. And it was actually, um, I had recorded it with a tattoo when I was finished, because that was the first time that I had looked at 
using somebody else's artwork and what they're doing with my own artwork and what I'm doing, but also looking at this notion of my, uh, my histories, my body, my land. And it was something that was very impactful for me. So I wanted to record it on my body. And um, it was something that I had never done before, actually recording the trauma, because as Peter had said earlier, that in being a body-based performance artist, there's a lot of trauma that we often cause to our bodies. And so I wanted to record the idea of that trauma and then to kind of move forward and figure out, okay, what, what am I doing next? So that is kind of like a reminder of this is where you left off and then you kind of got to pick up to move along from there. I think I'm going to stop there. That's a great, thank you so much, Ursula. Um, do you want to keep your, yeah, there we go. I wasn't sure if you're going to uh, unshare your screen. Um, oh my goodness. So many things we can talk about. Um, and thank you so much for, for sharing some, you know, recent work with us as well. Um, and, uh, and that contextualization in terms of um, the, the projects, but in terms of um, the landmarks project as well, because I think I'll actually my, my computer is actually sitting on the catalog <laughs> for landmarks. And I think some folks um, are aware that it happened, but not the intricacies in terms of how long a lot of the projects took to, to advance and develop. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we have some time and I'm wonder wondering how the three of you are feeling. Um, if you would like to have a conversation just amongst ourselves and then for a few minutes, um, if there's a question you have uh, for one of the other uh, folks here, and then we can open it up uh, quick, quick, you know, in the next few minutes uh, to, to questions from, from our audience member, members. Yes, that sound good? Yeah? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my God. We feel more, less, less formal, more, more casual. Um, I talked a little bit too long there. I didn't plan to talk that long about you those perfect. works. You were lovely. You were great. It was awesome. It was perfect. Yeah. Um, and again, you were, you know, we had to had the anchor at the end, right? So you brought it home. So thank you so much. <laughs> I'm sorry for my my uh, my sport metaphors. It's my previous life. I'll, I'll bring, especially when I'm tired, I bring them forward a little bit more than I probably should. Um, there's a lot of obviously you're such distinct practices but there's this link throughout all of them around addressing kind of this erasure but then through that 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 significance of presence um and uh and when i think about all of your work um this goes back to my early kind of dissertation research days um thinking about how uh, artists are researchers and and historians and um, all of you do such important work in bringing forward histories that you know either you know, or your families know, or have been, um, you know, silenced or erased in different measures, especially institutionally. And uh, so I just want to, you know, really think about and, and commend you and that ongoing work you do as, as artists um, and as an art historian, I think about how you are the ones writing these histories. And then sometimes folks like me get to get to write about how you do it. Um, and uh, that labor that is involved in all of that processes and whether that and 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 the impacts on your own uh, bodies as well mm -hmm. as um, you know the other impacts in terms of the, the difficulties of these histories. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing those with us today. Did you have? I, I'm just chatting. So well, I'm going to say but, thank you, Carla, for what you do because it's um, you know folks like you. There's it it helps to get things like performance out there because I find that performance is often left out of conversations within museums and institutions. So I want to give you like a big, a big nod to you, Carla, for the work that you do and creating the space for people like us to be able to engage in these conversations. And also Crystal, as Deanna had mentioned. Um, yeah. Um, I, yeah, let's hear more it, about that. <laughs> it's impossible. I, well, I struggle with the language to describe what that experience was like. Um, uh, I've known Crystal for years and she's worked out, to, I mean, we're besties now because Lord, we have these three, as I said, three hour conversations almost on the weekly. 
right? And and the project was being produced over this horrible black summer, this this summer of black murder, um, slaughter. Um, and it was hard. It was hard work to do. And it it uh, you know I don't think I could have worked with a hands off curator in any kind of a, in any kind of way. And for Crystal to honor the spiritual labor of the work. Um, she was in it all the way as well, right? So by the end of it, she was research. She kept researching and bringing me things. And I'm like, I just need to make the work now. Can you just stop sending me shit, please, right? You know, because she was just so in it, right? But I think that that's the thing that, I, you know, if there's anything I could hope for in this ongoing discussion about how to change institutions and museums and all that kind of stuff, um, working with somebody who knows your pain and history is such a important part of this work. Um, she probably pulled me out of a couple of deep, deep wormholes in the in the thick of it, really, because it, you know, I remember the very first inkling of an understanding of that that I had about this show and it was long before I even started doing the deep deep research of it all but I I admit I had a couple of cocktails and I you know texted her in the middle of the night and I I just it was just this tearful apology for the pain I was going to bring to her and the darkness that I was going to unearth in this place that she works and lives in right and I I just was so sorry, but I mean, but that is the nature of the work and she was willing to throw down, you know? Um, I think too about the fact that aside from the putting on the exhibition, she's giving tours of this show on the weekly, right? And what that does to her body. I have been, I'm on the hook for a recording for her that was, is two months away, like, like two, I'm, I'm two months late on it because I just can't bring my body to go back to this place to have this conversation about what I was doing. But Crystal's explaining what I'm doing on the weekly, you know, and that is, that is not something that you can pass off to a docent and it's something that uh, has a, a real physical and emotional toll on her as, you know, as she's doing this work. Um, but I think that that's just such an important part of this thing. So I'm thinking about what you do, Carla, and I'm thinking about the women that I've worked with in the last five to 10 years, really, who have all been, they're not allies. They're co-conspirators. They're, they're people that are in it just as much as we are. And it's not lip service and it's uh, important. And if anything, what I hope what we're in right now is a transition from that hands-off really fuckety imperial colonial way of curation that is still kind of rooted in extraction of experience and that we get to a place where curation is um, just as engaged and, and bodily um, involved as the making of the work is. I think for the kind of difficult work that we're trying to do to undo these institutions, I mean, however, which way you want to kind of frame that, I think that that's the reality of where we're at is uh, deeply spiritually, emotionally engaged intellectual pursuit. Does that make sense? You know, is that making sense? Yeah, totally. You can't, you can't phone it in. It's not something that you can go to a couple of cocktail parties and, you know, hope to kind of get the right connection to make, you know, it's not that shit. I'm sorry. I, I clearly speak like a sailor. I'm sorry. No, no. no, no. Yeah. And clearly. I'm sorry. Those relationships, the relationality, I think those are, <laughs> it's key. Oh, and I think it's so huge. It's so huge what everybody's saying. And, and it's like, when you come to a museum or to that space, knowing how fragile and how fraught it is on your body, you need to have somebody stand with you or align themselves with you. Yeah. And when we, uh, like when we worked on Peter Morin's museum, there was, a, there was a lot of things we had to uh, overcome as well uh, in the relationship building, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I, I realized that um, at that time that Karen, Karen Dufik was being brave and I was being brave. Mm -hmm. And we needed to do that together for mm -hmm. each other, with each other, so that we could make that project actually happen um and that bra that that shared bravery like like with crystal 
I mean, I, I only had, I only had the chance to chat with her once, Crystal. She's just really yeah. a beautiful human being. She's beautiful people. Yeah, and um, and then uh, and then it also changes your experience of the, what happens at the at the end. You know, because this is a living thing, right? I'm yeah, not, yeah. We're not just making things and putting them somewhere. They are, they are our breath. They are the ancestor artist's breath. Absolutely. We are the ancestor artist's breath, you know? Yep. Um, I love that. I think that's a perfect segue to Aaron's question, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Without even you knowing. Doesn't oh, wow. even know. Doesn't even, it just oh. happens. <laughs> It just like it just it just flows from the body, man. I it's a beautiful thing. And the moment where I was like, how am I gonna? And I'm like, oh, I don't have to do anything. Thank Never you. mind. Peter has done it. There it is. Oh, <laughs> Aaron, do you want to ask your question in the live, or should we just see it in the Q and A there and answer it? Oh, I can ask it. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to uh, jump in before you guys were finished talking. Oh, no, it's, it's all good. It. It's all do good. It. Do it, Hi, Aaron. Hi, Aaron. Hi. Uh, Tanse everyone. I uh, just want to say hi hi to all of you for your talks today. I'll just read my question and to Carla for your work um, moderating. I want to know um, if you could talk about the ephemerality of performance. That's one of the things that excites me the most. Uh, and makes me want to curate it all the time. Uh, and I really appreciate it in uh, the way that you're talk you, you talk about it in your practices. And uh, so what I'm wondering, um, oh, and then, uh, yeah, I really appreciate it about how your practices, as Carla said, work through visibility, erasure, and presence of the body. So I'm wondering if you could speak to the role of memory and commemoration in your work mm -hmm. and the connection of memory and ephemerality of, uh, to, to the ephemerality of performance. Did that make sense? Sorry. Yeah, no, make total sense. Total yeah. sense. Yeah. Total sense. Yeah. <laughs> we're just I thinking. Mean, <laughs> I mean, if, if we were all not performance artists, we'd be like, can you clarify? <laughs> <laughs> you define the parameters of performance. <laughs> By performance, do you mean like performance or like performance? Like what do you like what do you mean? What do you mean by that? So good, so right? Good. Performance art, or like just perform it. Anyway, um, I can, I can, I can, st I can start this one, Peter. Okay. Um, uh, I think a lot about the performance of blackness uh, in white spaces a great deal, uh, and we talked about that in the God of Gods project. This, this, the performance, the performance of identity itself, right? Um, and my work has always been, uh, beside it being about my family, it has always been about not producing pain porn um, about my family's history and being super, super conscious about whatever it is that I'm doing out in the world being uh, likely to be uh, misinterpreted and, and then used, um, ironically enough, against us, right? So the, everything that I do ha comes from a place of a, from a, vantage point of me watching white people watch me and then acting on that knowledge and so for performance generally um part of the reason why i bring it to the forefront i think is and i i'm very careful about when i introduce it um if i'm performing i am performing an embodied knowledge or an insight about black experience and if I'm particularly doing it, I'm doing it because it's too painful to give to somebody else to do. Um, and I have that kind of a conscious of relationship with the people that come onto my projects. Uh, there are things that I don't want them to do because I think it will harm them and they don't perhaps don't have the same emotional grounding. Um, I think about when you can't perform. And so that would be the other thing about the God of Gods project and recognizing that just re-uttering any of the language in that piece would harm the people that performed it, the people that watched it. It would just exhume, it extracts um, great harm. Um, and so I just, you know, there are decisions that I make about not. Um, my relationship to video and performance is all, but that kind of, that's one thing, but my relationship to video and performance and documentation of performance has everything to do with that notion of a black body was here. 
right? That you were, that a black body was seen uh, in some way and it was seen in this place and largely more often than not in uh, uh, disagreement with you and this needs to be recorded and inserted into this place because this history, this site has a deep, deep, deeply entrenched kind of patterning systemic system of, of wiping my presence out. So that's how I deal with uh, the ephemerality of, of uh, performance. I think about turning black bodies movements into other things, transcription. Uh, so dance pieces that I recreate from a video and then ultimately transfer it to dance notation, which makes it possible for somebody to uh, know the dance, learn the dance in the future. And then you could read it a, another way as a mapping of, of a performance and, and Black presence and again. So they're like, that, those are the things I'm thinking about very broadly. Um, but again, I have to emphasize that all of these things that I'm thinking through are within a context of white Canadian institutions. Um, and I am sure that if I was in a different neck of the woods that maybe had a different kind of population base, I probably would be doing works that are very, very different. So. Yeah. I personally, for me, um, I the, the memory and ephemerality of performance is something that I think about even before knowing what the whole performance looks like. I, I'm extremely curated from like beginning to end of like, is this going to be something that's documented? If it is documented, why and how? Uh, what is the, the echo or the memory I'm trying to leave? What is it going to look like if it's going to be in a space? Is this something that's consumable? Is it not consumable? And if it is consumable, why? And what am I offering for people to consume? So I think about um, all the way from beginning to end. And there was also a period of time when I was making performances that weren't documented at all because I was so against having that documentation because I felt like I didn't have a grasp on it because I was afraid that if my image, my story, my action was captured, I was afraid that it would be um, capitalized upon from somebody else or be taken advantage of. So there was a number of years that I didn't document any performances at all. And then in having conversations with a couple of mentors of mine, we spoke about it's like, well, think of it because I come from a theater background. It's like, well, think about what is that set design? What is that press release? What is the, um, you know, what is that, uh, that billet going to be? So I kind of thought of it from a theater perspective with regards to image making and the capturing of images, but also how that story, that memory, that echo uh, remains or how I can, have, uh, you know, kind of like a control so that people can't misconstrue because I didn't want people to think that they could take something that I had created and then just apply whatever it is that their ideas were or to put it in whatever context they wanted. So I appreciate your question, Aaron. Um, it's definitely something that I think a, a lot of people think about, but we don't often have the opportunity to talk about how we do that within our works because performance is often set up as this very ephemeral thing and then it kind of, it happens and then it's gone, right? But even looking at Deanna saying that she creates something so that there can be an archive put into that archive, you know, it's a, um, an, an instigation of like, okay, I'm gonna take your history and then just hold the mirror shield up to you. Outstanding. Oh, it's amazing. It's amazing. I, I, I yeah, Ursula, I, there's a lot that we don't get to talk about. Like the performance artists, we don't. Like even your, even your offering earlier about pain and healing from pain. And like you do this performance and then you, like there's some things that I've done where I've had to wait, I've had to wait six months to feel normal again, mm -hmm. you know? or the training that you do, like the performance that we I did for Abadakwane, where I trained for a full year and able to perform, and able to perform that mm -hmm. day for eight hours straight, you know? Um, I think a part of, I, I don't know the moment where my brain turned and uh, I started to read all of the objects created by ancestor artists and museum as uh, ephemera of performance art you know, performances, right? Like the beading, you know, you're doing this and, you know, 
there's all these sort of like moments that this object is a record of the movement of a body with a specific intention within a specific space for a specific time and for a specific effort, you know? So I think that partly that makes me feel like I'm, when I go to the museum, I own it mm -hmm. because those folks are talking to me, mm -hmm. you know? And those objects uh, are speaking languages that I can read mm -hmm. um, because I have this body and I have moved my body in the same way that those ancestor artists have moved their bodies, you mm -hmm. know? Um, that first performance that I talked about earlier, it was like, it was, uh, you know, like, it's a little bit scattered there, but um, just thinking about that moment, I, Museum of Anthropology uh, asked me to uh, give a talk because they had curated an exhibition of Tal Ten objects. And so I, I thought they actually, um, I thought they were actually interested in my practice, mm. but they were, they just wanted me to reflect on their exhibition. Mm. right uh which is fine i guess you know and you're a young artist you're like i will take any job <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but in that in that um in that moment in the question and answer period one of the folks in the room asked me they said would you ever show your work in a museum and i said no i said no uh, because i didn't know how to protect the spirit of the work and I don't know how the museum right now is protecting the spirit of those works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then Karen Bembersett took that on as a challenge. Mm -hmm. And she, yeah. she, she ran into me in the, um, she ran into me at a, a restaurant <laughs> and said, well, I'm curating the new forms festival. I want you to do this. And I'd never done, you know, it's pretty much a very unhealthy, shy, I used to smoke a pack and a half of cigarettes a day kind of thing. I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that only exists now because of stories. Like, you know, that performance only exists now because of stories. And I, I think the song remains in there. The song remains in all of the museums. Yeah. But the fact that it's not documented and the fact that it exists as stories, that is beautiful in my mind, that that is how we have traditionally exchanged knowledge and wisdom, you know, that's how it works. I think something at all, you know, I'm, I'm now moving on to, so, so you're not talking about this performance, so you're talking about performance. So like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm shifted to a different, different performance, <laughs> yeah, yeah, performance yeah, yeah. or performance, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I'm thinking about, you know, any, uh, so for me, again, like, you know, I, I am very caught up in oral tradition and the stories that my family has told more often than not, the stories that they have not told, right? Uh, and I think about, you know, my desire to create something out of it, the desire to document it. I mean, I think, and I, maybe this is a question because would, would we, the two, both you, Peter and Ursula, would you be doing this kind of work or considering documentation if your creative, if your ambition was not to be, how do I put this, to, uh, not to be a professional artist or not to be in the institutions or not to show in institutions, would you document your work? Would you make work better yet, right? Because I ask this because my, the deal I cut with my ancestors about the work that I am doing is that I know I am a nerd, just like you, Ursula, and I'm like all about this history shit, right? But I don't want to write a book and I don't want to write a book for somebody that and go through that whole ridiculous process of going through the academy and having some white people talk at me about how I should phrase this stuff and they don't know, you know what I mean? So the deal I cut with my ancestors is I would do this work and I would I would make art about it because it did the job of 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 exchanging the knowledge and moving it forward and not and not forgetting, right? But it's a bigger question of, you know, if I had a different skill set 
what I do, like, would I be doing this? Would I be working towards document? Do you, you know what I'm trying to get at? Like, it's this, like, it's the very nature of being an artist and being and working within a white institutional system of, of galleries that obliges us to think about translating our embodied knowledge and wisdom into a thing, at least partially, not completely, but, you know, for within the context of say what we're doing right now in this kind of an art world context, right? Is that making any sense at all? I, I think it makes sense. And, and I'm uh, peering over into the chat box here because then I've just got to pull in another question here yes. that actually, because Rochelle is um, talking about, about how the conceptual developments might differ between art galleries and anthro mu museums. Yeah. and how these categorizations may have changed over the years of our practices. I think right. that kind of hits the nail on the head for yeah. the same question that you're asking, Deanna. It's like, well, who, like, why do we make the art? Who are we making it for? And does that change based on what we're making, who we're making it for, and how it's going to live from this point on, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think I think it's a very, um, it's personally for me, I, I agree with, um, you know, kind of that, whatever it is that I do, I always think about, I'm like, what am I trying to say? Mm -hmm. Why am I saying it? Who am I saying it to? And what's the best way for me to say it? And, mm -hmm. I, and, and I credit um, Rita McCo mm -hmm. as uh, somebody who has helped me to kind of develop that, that ethic within my, my practice, mm -hmm. because she always, she, um, you know, in teaching at NASCAT, she'd be like, you know, if you're going to introduce this pen into your performance, what does that mean? Yeah. What does it mean when you put that object in there? Is it different than using this pen? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. You know, to very much consider every little component of that, the narration of that story or the sharing of that song. You know, if you sing a sing an honoring song and you sing it in the tone of a, a, mem a memorial song as opposed to an honoring song, it's going to change the entire context of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it ties in um, to what Peter is saying that, you know, it's it's thinking about that responsibility too, because where if you if you carry this responsibility as um, an indigenous storyteller whatever medium you're using you're carrying that story and you're sharing it but it's a very it's a it's a gift and a knowledge that should not be taken lightly and mm -hmm. when you carry that story and you share it to somebody else then it has to you have to be sure that they're ready for that responsibility mm -hmm. because that's when things get complicated mm -hmm. i'm going to jump in and peter do you want to go before me I'm still thinking. I'm still thinking. No. Okay. Please. Yeah. So Ursula, there's something that you said that just struck me about the distinction between a museum and a, and, and a gallery, right? Black, bo Black Canadian bodies are not in the museums. And that and that therein lies the dilemma. And I guess that that's where the need to document comes from, right? What actually resides in most Canadian um institutions at Canadian museums are evidence of black Americans, but not black Canadians. You know what I mean? And that swap out and all of that and all that that's supposed to do. So I, I it just, it just occurred to me that I have never made a work with, with an understanding or an intention of it being engaged with a museum. Mm. I've only done work in a gallery context so that it's just a whole other, oh, right, mm -hmm. museum. That would imply that we are in Canadian history. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing about Canadian history is insisting that we're not here. You know? So yeah, that's what that's that was that's what comes to mind. That's a huge um like I just I feel that all over. Yeah. And um I guess the 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 next words are like you know. There's curators who are listening here. Yeah. It's time to help change this, do change this, do the work. Um, uh, and I, 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 I like I, I have had the chance to do work in in museums, and I, I'm I am 
very aware of who I want to talk to, mm -hmm. uh, you know? So uh, I wonder about that. I wonder about that in relationship to this, this moment in our shared conversation as well. Like, because I, like I, I've done several performances now where I've only spoken to the totem poles, you know, including like, um, well, the one, uh, the one where I sang a uh, hello darling, uh, repeatedly by Conway Twitty to the to the totem <laughs> poles, <laughs> you know, like. Um, but what I what I love about performance art is that it, because it's so expansive, um, that it it can open up unimagined possibilities within that space, and that and those unimagined possibilities also um reframe our entire experience of that space because when i when i would go to museums i i did feel excluded invisibilized um and then when you actually touch the artwork of your of the people uh there's something that completely changes in your in your body you know mm -hmm. um i also like just thinking about what your diana what you're offering earlier i don't know if this this is not an answer, but just is coming into my head mm -hmm. um, that the performances, like there are, there are multiple sites of performing knowledge and performing experience, which are uh, in continuum, right? So mm -hmm. I perform at home when we have ceremonies and social dances. I make the artwork that is worn by my cousin, for example, in those social dances. And then I also perform right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with 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 us and, and baby <laughs> um, and I think a uh, curator needs to uh, work it so that the three of us can perform too at some point I'm just saying yep. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm sure yeah. other people do too. <laughs> but you know, uh, now I'm going to go to the other performance, 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 or performance. Okay. Uh, so... Performing, performing arts. The, well, let's not uh, go there. Yeah, that's a whole. That's a whole other beast. That's a whole other thing. A whole other thing. But um, I was just thinking about this idea. There's a lot of scholarship or kicking around about the exhibition is a, a, a performance in and of itself, and thinking about that. Um, you know, I mean, all of this, all of what we do in a way from a curatorial perspective is about staging an event, yeah. you know, staging a thing that will be up for X number of days, weeks, hours, whatever. And there's a whole kind of team of people that come around to help massage it into looking like being like the thing that everybody wants it to be you know, complete with lighting and sound and, you know, you know, all of that business, right? That is an exhibition, that is a performance in and of itself, right? So just wondering about, I guess, if we we're thinking about unsettling something, would, and this is the catch-22 of it all, would, so would not, I don't even know what that is, what not, that kind of, not staging that kind of performance would look like. So I'm making, I keep asking these things that are like flow of consciousness. And if you can keep up with me all, I am thrilled. But if I am talking trash, please just disregard altogether. But you know what I'm saying? Like, and who, who are these, who are these events for? Right? Um, I, I'm, I'm starting my way towards looking at the history of the National Gallery, um, just by following the queen, Queen Victoria. Her daughter uh, and son-in-law opened, opened the National Gallery, right? And if we work from that place, and many Canadians think that that's the end all be all place to be is in the National Gallery of some, in some sort. But if we understand that the National Gallery is created for the queen's pleasure, right? So then what does it mean if we continue to stage these things in these spaces for that, those people? Is that you following y'all? Yeah. 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 And I think that goes and, back. And, and you're making the perfect segue to the other question in the yes. chat. <laughs> perform. <laughs> perform. 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 Okay. Audrey, do you want to um, ask your question, or would you like us just to read? <laughs> Are you still there? Okay. We can just respond to the question then. <laughs> read. Okay. Thank you. Have you been able to see the question? How will inclusivity look like? How will inclusivity? 
conclusively look like if defined by the different BIPOC voices in the space of the chain. Mm -hmm. The threat of a dominant monoculture. I fell off. I fell off the wagon with my job. They're reading it out loud. Sorry, y'all. The can, idea of a, that's okay. You're doing I have a great faith job. You can read. <laughs> You're doing a great job. We can. <laughs> yeah, no. I, I like, think it's just. I think it's, her audio is to tie, <laughs> It's just to tie it back right into what you're saying. You know, if we're if we're making this playhouse for like the monarchy then what does that mean if all of a sudden the the people that are constructing the play that's going to be taking place at the playhouse if they're black and indigenous bodies and minds um you know how 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 does the narrative or the rules of that playhouse change <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, and and i think that's what um agri is is asking essentially i yeah. could have misread it wrong that's yeah i think so i mean that's how i read it as well yeah and, yeah. and the necessity and so that thinking about deanna your recent experience with this exhibition like the necessity to have leadership so cur curators yes as well as leadership within these institutions um at higher levels mm -hmm. um think about um, how the, the ways in which the curators, BIPOC curators, their experiences also are within those institutions will shift and change. If we have leadership, at, you know, in terms of directorships and, and chief curators that mm -hmm. are BIPOC, mm -hmm. um, and what do our institutions look like then? as well yeah and and i think not just that but also docents yeah. administrators yeah. finance like the Everybody. entire institution because if there's one person who is of a colored body in that institution all of the weight is on that mm -hmm. one person mm -hmm. and the responsibility is on that one person and it's going to be a disservice in the mm -hmm. in in the long game you know mm -hmm. the, the more people that are in there of diverse voices and backgrounds and histories and cultures then we can begin to kind of you know have all kinds of different conversations but when yeah. it's like yes that's the first indigenous curator in blah 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 blah, blah then yeah. it's going to be like oh my god please somebody give them a support net because they're yeah. Yeah. fall apart yeah, yeah same for academics all of, like all of that stuff it's it's a horrible experience to be that one it's it, it if anything what that points to is that the institution or this whatever the place the workplace is not serious because you know they have no serious intention about doing anything because nobody nobody can take that task on single-handedly nobody mm -hmm. could the whole mess was created by thousands, millions of people. How is it possible that one person could do that job? It's just, it's crazy making, right? Yeah, so there needs to be like massive critical hiring and then supporting of younger people coming through. I have had this conversation like, there's, well, we don't have enough people to hire. Well, support people coming through. Yeah, um, but also, you know, a basic for a gallery space or a museum space would be why are all the docents English? English yeah. speakers. Why is that? Yeah. And and the fact that most of the institutions that we're working with the dominant language is English. And think about how many different communities of people mm -hmm. don't can't won't come through the door because it's not speaking in a language that they recognize. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean that just that basic language dominance thing. I mean, I'm uh, I'm speaking from Montreal, y'all. So you understand the logic here, right? Like there's there's something. And, and it's riffing off of a, a friend of mine who used to work at the Vancouver Art Gallery that they had an exhibition on, on early Asian art. And the idea was to have docents that could speak the language. And it was shot down like who, like it was crazy talk because, you know, the mindset um, on, on senior administration was that we're marketing, this is all for a white audience. So why would you do that? You know what I mean? Hmm. This was a basic question of why isn't, why isn't my exhibition translated to Punjabi, I don't know, or German or whatever it is, if we were really going to get down to it, mm -hmm. about access and making change and generating building communities and generations and generations after to take and it apart. Actually wanted to have accountabilities towards your local local populations and yeah. think about where you live and who you work for, it should be reflective of, of that range of language yeah. and presence. Yeah. Um, obviously, uh, you know, universities and art galleries are, have been challenged by this for a long time mm -hmm. and like to create simple kind of simple responses by creating binaries. And so it's time to shift that practice 100%. Absolutely. It's also um, 
<laughs> it's very funny to me. And I, as I have been deep, like deep thinking about institutional policies and, and uh, politics uh, recently uh, in my, in my role, in one of my roles at OCAD. And um, it's really funny to me that the, uni the institution tricks itself into believing it's more important than the people. Right. And it's like, oh, well, we have 135 years behind us. We are an institution. We are creating this. We are, you know, uh, cutting the pathway for future culture, whatever. And it's like, uh, well, actually, the only reason why you have 135 years is because behind you is because for 135 years, people have been coming to your uh, space. You know, so how do we flip this around so that it actually is like honoring that the continuum is the bodies that move into those spaces, as well as the bodies that have been excluded from those mm -hmm. spaces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's a huge thing actually. Uh, um, also like have a place to cook food. Like, you know, like let's design, redesign the space, you know? A value is sharing food for many uh, BIPOC cult communities, cultures. Um, I love to come and cook. Uh, and, you know, I do food performances. I work with Ayumi. <laughs> Ayumi is, the, yeah. you know, he and I, we do this thing called First Context Catering, right? We would do that totally. <laughs> you should you know? do Viva. You should do Viva. <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> cook for 200 people for four days They're, yeah it's totally totally do it, do it. it's like it's like a food performance you'd love it peter but the, the, this is the thing too though right it's like the my my litmus test is how many alarm bells are going to go off if i want to smudge in here oh. you know and it's like you know the the smallest action which happens to be one of the more powerful indigenous knowledge practice and production pieces right but it's really like it's not actually smoke folks it's something else <laughs> why are you afraid of me while i'm holding this smudge so much fear can i make that into a t-shirt <laughs> i want to say why are you afraid of me while i'm holding this smudge peter morin 2020 <laughs> And yet again, he would be uh, transitioning into another conversation because somebody would have to answer the shirt. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yet again. Amazing. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah, procedures and policies based on t-shirts. I love it. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Um, it's four after just a few minutes after four and I, I actually I mean I'd love to keep chatting because I feel like we could chat for multiple more hours um, um, but it, unless there's a, a few things you wanted to, to, to say before we before we go um, but I just wanted to, to extend a, a real warm thank you thank you so much the three of you for joining us and who are all of our participants um, and attendees and audience members also wanted to thank our, 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 our research assistants that have done so much work. Brody, I know you're here. Thank you for coordinating um, all, the, um, all of us <laughs> so that we're here today. Um, and um, also to, um, to just acknowledge uh, the labor that's gone into kind of organizing all of this. So thank you all. Um, uh, there's going to be further um, uh, activities happening. Uh, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock Atlantic time, there'll be the research creation workshop and another uh, panel happening at 2 p.m. that I get to facilitate with um, Aidan Gillis, uh, incredible uh, Mi'kmaq um, cultural programmer, curator, artist uh, from uh, working at Archive of Nova Scotia, as well as uh, Julie, Dr. Julie Nagam from Winnipeg, University of Winnipeg and uh, Dr. Heather Gloliorte from uh, University of, uh, or Concordia University, sorry. Um, so that's tomorrow. But I just wanted to say thank you all for coming and um, I hope we all get together sometime soon. And I think we need to bring Deanna and Peter to Halifax. Rochelle, <laughs> maybe me. collaborative project. Yeah, and Ursula, come on. Anna Ursula. Anna Ursula. Anna Ursula. Anna Ursula. I mean, and this that is challenging to get you here as it is. I can drive and pick you up if I had to. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm only, I'm just like two hours away. These guys are further. 
<laughs> you you can come and quarantine at my shack in the woods. <laughs> Deal. Artist Done. President. Deal. <laughs> Deal. Uh, Gosh. What uh, a lovely afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs>